Good morning. My name is Matthew Cherry in Alva, Oklahoma. And today I'll be reading an excerpt from the beginning of my short story, Big House, which won the SAS Short Fiction Contest. Big House. Casper and I dug the grave with the butts of our guns and buried the fox at dawn. We'd been in Iraq for less than a month, and Casada had been away on assignment so much that I'd seen almost none of him since arriving in country. I'd been foolish enough to miss him. The fox taught me better. Tough, tall plants ran in a wide strip down the center of the wadi. I later learned that they were a kind of wild corn. We filtered through them four abreast, rifles raised, cursing at the absurdity of mosquitoes in the desert. Patrol was even less eventful by night than by day. By day, you sometimes ran across a good-sized viper or a local taking a shit in the weeds. It broke up the monotony. Casada was the first one to see the fox. He laughed and the animal startled. It ran right over my boots in its terror. Casada came after it like a kid at recess. He slid on stones, barreled through the corn. He clapped me on the shoulder as he went by and told me to come on or I'd miss all the fun. We made a game of herding the fox before us. I'm sure it could have escaped. We were spread wide, thrashing the corn grass into a kind of frenzy. But it went forward in panic. The sides of the wadi must have been too steep for it. It was a small, sleek thing. Nothing but a streak of tufted white fur moving like liquid through the grass. I knew we were terrorizing it, but we were bored. That's my excuse, that we were bored. In the disorder of the chase, I got separated from the others. I had just come out of the corn when I heard the shot. I ran down the bed and found Casper and St. George standing back from Casada. The fox had tried the bank after all. The loose stone had slowed it down, making it an easy target. Casada lowered the rifle and we all watched the little body tumble back to the wadi floor. I didn't see that it was still alive until Casada drew his knife. Hey, little guy, he said. He walked forward. The blade of his knife was a dull length of shadow in his fist. Hey there, fella. The fox raised itself up on its front legs and tried to scramble back up the bank, but Casada had hit it somewhere in the back and it could only drag itself along. I saw no blood. Hey, buddy. Casada slung his rifle behind him and out of the way. Hey, buddy, buddy. Casada. This was Casper, whose neck and cheeks still hadn't quite lost their dewlapped look from boot camp. Casada turned. Casper said nothing, but his rebuke was plain. Ah, come on, Casada said. They don't have foxes where I come from. He was the estranged son of an illiterate dock worker from New Jersey. And he once told us that he had joined the Corps because if he was going to get beaten, he at least wanted to get paid for it. I want a pair of fox socks. He started, maybe liking the sound of the phrase and giggled. Fox socks. He turned back to the animal, which had ceased its struggles and lay still watching us with ink drop eyes. The fur on its muzzle was a shade darker than the rest of its coat. It looked fine as silk. I will not wear you in a box, Casada said. He went forward. I will not wear you over rocks. I raised my rifle and shot the fox in the chest. Casada whirled. His knife was raised. Come on, Casper said. He didn't outrank any of us, but his basset hound features gave him a grave air that had a way of getting through to people. Let's finish our route. For a second or two, Casada just looked at me. Then he laughed and sheathed his knife. He looked the same as before. He walked away and I followed. A few hours later, Casper and I came back and buried the fox among the roots of the desert corn. Thank you for listening. 
and stay safe. Hi, I'm Louis DeSimone, coming to you from Minneapolis, Minnesota. I want to thank everyone involved with Saints and Sitters for um, keeping this festival up even um, virtually. Hopefully we will see each other again next year in New Orleans. Um, I was thrilled to be a runner-up in the fiction contest this year, and I'm going to read to you a section, the opening of my story, Mesopotamia. I was still fumbling in the kitchen when the doorbell rang. The clock over the refrigerator said 6.35, so I immediately knew who it was. Brendan had a nasty habit of arriving early for everything. I buzzed him in and double-checked the oven. The cassoulet was simmering gently, the smell of fennel lingering in the air as I closed the door. Everything was under control, so I could rest for a few minutes until the others arrived. Brendan greeted me with a bottle of Cote de Rhone. I wasn't sure what you were serving, he said with a shrug, apologizing for, apologizing for bringing a $50 bottle of wine. This will be perfect, I said. Shall I open it now? Just decant it. In the meantime, can you get me a Campari and soda? I searched the bar. The alcohol was organized according to the frequency of use. Gin and vodka in front, a variety of whiskeys and rums next, and everything else cluttered haphazardly in the back. Behind me, I could hear Brendan settling into the chair. It's got good bones, this place, he said, an odd gruffness in his voice. I finally found the Campari, the bottle mottled like it had caught a case of glass-borne measles. Still half full of potent red booze, it looked like cherry cough syrup, but as I remembered, it tasted more like arsenic. I was surprised I even had any. It must have been a party gift someone had brought ages ago, someone with very peculiar ideas about party cocktails. I mixed his drink and made myself a gin and tonic. When I turned around, drinks in hand, I found Brendan gazing at the room, neck contorted to take in the far corners of the building, the ceiling. Have you ever had this appraised, he continued. What, the apartment? I could easily get you 800 for it. The market's insane right now. A one-bedroom on the edge of the Castro, worth that much. I shook my head in disbelief and took a seat. I only paid 200 Yes, Brendan said, 20 years ago. It's a whole other world these days. Handing Brendan his drink, I studied the crown molding above his head, the still gleaming hardwood floor beneath our feet. I'd installed the brass curtain rods myself, half a day spent standing on a chair with an electric drill in my hand and a pencil in my teeth for marking the holes. That had been my first major household chore when I'd bought the place. Now I was a regular at Home Depot, a handyman monkey. Owning property had turned me into my father. I couldn't sell, I said. Where would I go? If this place is worth that much, so is everything else. It's not as if I can afford to upgrade. Brendan gazed sheepishly into his glass. His dark hair was still thick and curly. At this point, he was probably fixed for life. I could find you something. Believe me. Brendan had stumbled into the real estate business at the perfect moment, just when the city was starting to recover from the dot bomb. He'd been a bartender in the early days, and then a teacher. But the kids got worse and worse each year, and he was never going to get rich off an annual cost of living increase that barely kept up with his rent. He quit and started studying for his real estate license. He said it was the best decision of his life. Even in the off years, when commissions were thin, he at least enjoyed his work, and no one at the office was shooting spitballs at his back. Maybe not in this neighborhood, he said, gesturing toward the window with his drink. The Campari caught the light and glowed in his hand like nuclear waste. The demand is pretty high here, but there are other spots where things are a little slower. Potrero Hill, the outer sunset. The outer sunset, I repeated trying not to scowl too obviously. The name sounded like a euphemism for death, and the architecture confirmed it. Are you serious? There are some great places out that way, Brendan squinted thoughtfully. I'll take you for a drive next Sunday, see a few open houses. Don't rush me, I said. My glass was sweating. I wiped my hand on my pants and gazed over Brendan's shoulder. This isn't a surprise party, is it? He asked, thankfully changing the subject. No, I replied. You can't surprise Oscar. He knows all. And besides, he would kill me if I put him on the spot. I opened the wine and found a decanter in the cabinet. As a matter of fact, I added, watching the wine swirl its way toward the wide base of the decanter, we should probably pretend this isn't a birthday party at all. 
As much as Oscar loves attention, he's still a little shell-shocked about turning 50. How do we pretend it's not his birthday? Just don't use the word, I said. Birthday? No. 50. Thanks very much. Hey everyone, my name is Matt Haynes and I'm from Butte, Montana. Uh, today I'm going to be reading the first part of my short story, What Covers the House is a Roof, which was a runner-up for the Sinners and Saints prize. When small man looks past the glare of spotlights into the audience, he can see their white teeth gleaming, their smiles ear to ear. He's thinking about this song he's playing, this horrible slack key song called Wee Ha Swing. These days he plays it before the tourists come to the stage with their sweaty dollar bills. They're full from Honolulu Luau and drunk on Blue Hawaiians. They've heard it somewhere, maybe in a cab or read about it in the Hawaiian Airlines magazine. They hear the first eight bars and awe and whistle. Small man smiles, beads of perspiration catching in those lights and throws his head back like he's into it, like he loves that swing. But he's not, and he doesn't. He's thinking about how fat he's been his whole life. Ever since Debugga was born, his tutu would say, and she was there so she would know. Small man's mother gave birth at Tutu's one-bedroom house in Peahi on Maui. She didn't have electricity, so the room was lit with half-spent white candles from the Baptist church and several tall vertebrae of kukui nuts strung through with trussing twine and hung from the ceiling, their oil pushing a bitter, pungent smell into the air. After Tutu wiped the birth from his face and blew into his nostrils, he burst into low moans, and then she thrust him against his mother's bare chest and covered them both in an all-family kapa cloth, its black and white geometric designs like a protection. The little bugo on baby Buddha, Tutu said, which was a sweet thing to say because he was a baby, and even saying a baby is a little ugly can seem a little sweet, but that kind of sweetness doesn't translate into adulthood, and it's nothing less than nauseating at 30. On Fridays, after his last set, small man goes to Max's bathhouse on Hobron Street. In the dry sauna, there are boys who he knows will not notice him, or when they do, his presence will drive them away. Mostly, he's given up on the expectation of any sex, any small talk, any sort of kindness. Now, small man comes to sit in front of the full-length mirror and look on himself. His brown belly hides his penis and testicles. His Polynesian tattoos stretch and sag around his arms and chest. He doesn't eat on Fridays, even though he knows it won't make any kind of difference that day. He thinks about being fat since he was just little and how, as he grew, the neighbor kids named him Small Man. He thinks about how that was never a bad thing, how it was also something sweet they did, like calling the transvestites on Hotel Street Honey Girls. Now Small Man comes here to look on himself, get eye to eye, and affirm, despite all this, I am made to love. This is what he remembers each lonely day. At home, small man eyes the refrigerator. Many times he has thought about putting up pictures of ripped men looking hot on the beach or sad fat men, but it seems too embarrassing. Instead, the back of a white envelope is held up by a small magnetic pineapple reads, Whoa, boy. And some nights that is enough to get him through to the morning, though those nights are filled with fever dreams. But some nights it's not enough. Sometimes small man sees that envelope, taps it a few times with his pointer finger and says, fuck you, boy, and turns it over to an empty telephone, cellophane window. Tonight is one of those nights. He starts with a bag of broccoli and cauliflower trying to fill his stomach, but it doesn't suffice and he's on to four king's rolls, Nutella, and a glass of 2%. For a minute he lets it settle, gives himself a beat to smile and pretend that he's not going to eat more. Then it's pizza rolls because they take a little more time to cook, another bit of time to rest and feel good, to feign moderation. Then there's the tub of cookie dough, which he knows will only make him restless. Still, he eats it, and then retires to his sofa and the ever-deepening dip in the middle cushion. He's still hungry, but he stops there because he's thinking that if he could just get through every Friday, they might add up to something. And he falls asleep, mumbling mantra 13 from the 21 affirmations for weight loss. I am choosing progress over perfection. On Saturday morning, he forgets and indulges his sadness with two burger patties and two mounds of rice topped with three eggs and gravy with a short stack of pancakes. After, he goes to his day job doing laundry at the park shore Waikiki. While he once managed the laundry room, all the walking became too much. 
And while he was demoted, upper management has been kind and allows him to sit at the industrial washers and dryers, transferring and folding sheets and towels. He stacks them neatly for the housekeepers to divide and stock and redress the rooms. By mid-morning, he is already thick with the smell, so he changes his shirt from the afternoon for the afternoon, which makes him feel sharp. At lunch, in the break room, he eats only a Greek yogurt, half a bagel, and a cup of fruit. The other employees smile and accept his facade, though he knows they know that a 300-calorie lunch didn't get him to 450 pounds. When the day is done, co-workers invite him to barbecues or out for poo-poos and drinks, but he always declines. He returns home to his small apartment to eat like he's wanted all day, and then he moves to the sofa with his ukulele and plays until his fingers and forearms and shoulders tire. That's it. Um, thanks for listening, and thanks to Sinners and Saints for choosing me as a runner-up this year. Have a good one, y'all. And the Sultan's Palace is actually a chapter from my novel. My novel is called Ash Tuesday. It hasn't been published yet. I'm still working on finding a publisher for it. But it basically tells the story of 10 tour guides, 10 people who give ghost tours in the French Quarter of New Orleans. So the Sultan's Palace actually follows one of those characters. His name is James. All you really need to know about him is that he is a tour guide. And in addition to that, he has a day job at a senior center. So I'll get right to it. And when we finish, we'll be starting our Mardi Gras masks of transgression, he said, holding up the one he'd made. See, now I'm in disguise. Once you put these on, I won't recognize any of you, which means you can get away with whatever you want, any of the seven deadly sins. Except probably murder, and don't murder anybody. I'm looking at you, Irene. Murder's not one of the seven deadly sins, Irene grabs back. She was a fat and sharp-witted old woman who no one really liked. Most of the old folks were vacant and cooperative, but he and Irene often heckled each other. Maybe not, but that kerchief has got to be, he said, gesturing to her garish orange scarf. It was patterned with purple flowers that looked like puckered assholes. Burn, chuckled the woman next to her. Some of them had picked up James' millennial slang. It was cute. Well, not too long from now, he'll be burning in hell, Irene muttered sourly under her breath. Oh, I heard that. Not too long from now? What's that supposed to mean? James said, his hands fluttering to his cheeks. Do I need a different moisturizer, Irene? Am I wrinkly? Homophobia was not something James had to deal with on a daily basis, and in situations like this, it felt humorous and quaint, creating in him a sort of nostalgia of disgust for his adolescence in rural Kentucky. His parents, not particularly political one way or the other, had accepted his queerness with the same lack of interest they took in his photography and track meets. Of course, there were the same school bullies and dumb jocks that every gay teen has to endure, but James was generally able to shut them up. He had a killer sneer and knew exactly what to say and do to make anyone feel powerless and insecure. It was a skill he prided himself on, and he honed it constantly by keeping a cynical running commentary in his mind, a never-ending inner monologue of condescension towards everyone and everything around him. He had to be careful, especially when drinking, not to let these cruelties slip to the surface and come out of his mouth, but to keep this playful negging from crossing the real line into hurtfulness. It did happen. And he knew what it looked like on each of his friends' faces, that momentary flash of shock and hurt, so quickly replaced by a blank smile, and minutes, hours, even days of keeping him at emotional arm's length. Whatever, he told himself. People shouldn't be so sensitive. Okay, everybody, he said at the end of the class hour, leave your hearts on the rack to dry. Everybody except Irene, whose heart is already as dry as a ten-day-old dog turd. There it was, that momentary flash of pain and vulnerability across the old woman's face. He didn't care. Anthony, a sweet old man who James was pretty damn sure was a homo too, took him aside after class as he packed up the supplies. You should try to be gentler with Irene, he said. Her daughter just died, you know. Was her daughter a homophobe too? Oh, she doesn't mean those things she says. She just wants attention. You know, she doesn't get any visitors. James watched Irene as she shuffled over to the rack to put her heart out to dry. Love, 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 it said in glittery all caps. He'd watched her painstakingly letter the words with her shaking hands. She really did work hard on the art projects. Apart from her shitty attitude, she was probably the best student in the class. He got in his car and drove home in a foul mood. Why had Irene's daughter died, he wondered. Probably overweight like her mother, a victim of high cholesterol or something like that. James didn't understand people who didn't make an effort to stay in shape. But still, to lose a daughter... He thought again of Irene and her shaking hands. 
Her scarf hadn't really been that ugly. At least she made an effort to be different. At least she wore something other than the plain scrub so many of the residents showed up to class in. If he was in a boring-ass nursing home, he'd probably wear weird shit, too. He pictured himself, old and infirm, wearing his, by then, threadbare leopard print trucker hat just to get attention from the staff who didn't even like him. Irene never had any visitors, Anthony had said. James' anger began to soften the gloomy knot of sadness blooming in his chest. Surely when he got old, he'd be alone too, abandoned in some nursing home with no one to visit him. Most of the other residents had spouses who died, but he was fairly sure Irene had never had a husband to begin with. She was too much of a cunt to find love like him. Hey, this is Morgan Hepstetter coming to you from Louisiana, New Orleans. Um, I will be reading to you from Saints and Sinners' latest 2020 anthology where I have my story, Maid Man, which is about a trans man who gets in a bit of hot water. Let's begin. It's just a cat. The white pool ball flew across the green fabric and sunk straight into the side pocket, which was how Alex knew he was in trouble. Vince was a pool aficionado. Pool was to Vince what bowling was to the dude. Vince never missed a shot. Alex had his hip against the pool table, Miller High Life in hand. When he dared to lift his eyes, he saw Vince glaring at him, cue stick still in hand. He approached, and for a second, Alex thought that his uncle might hit him over the head with it. Just a cat, Vince repeated, his voice pitching with rage. When Alex tried to look away, to the fat guy playing poker, or the groups of jacks doing shots at the bar, Vince jabbed his finger in his chest and forced Alex's attention back on him. You listen to me, you hopped up little shit. This isn't just a cat. It's the Capo's cat. You know what that means? Vince's eyes were red-rimmed. He always got sloppy and tense when he was drunk. Alex wet his lips with the tip of his tongue. It's a big responsibility. You're goddamn right, Vince barked, spit hitting Alex in the face. It's a big responsibility. The capo tells you to watch his cat or change his light bulb or wipe his ass. You do it, no questions asked. Capiche? The bar smelled like stale piss. His beer was lukewarm and Vince was drunk beyond the point of it being fun for anyone. Alex didn't want to watch a cat. Mostly, he just wanted to go home. But that wasn't an option. He'd given up that right at the start of summer, when he'd been booted from boot camp, and his mother wouldn't take him back in, and his uncle Vince had been generous enough to let him sleep on his couch after wiping the tiny mouse turds from the mattress. Vince lived in a shitty shotgun in the Seventh Ward that took Alex 20 hours to get to on the Greyhound. It didn't matter that Vince was drunk most of the time, that he'd slept all day and stayed out all night, or that he'd been in and out of jail more times than anyone could count. He had a place to sleep, and that was fine for now. They lived on different time schedules for a couple weeks, Alex applying to every service industry job he could find during the day, Vince lumbering out of the bedroom at sunset, and nothing but his boxers to stand in front of the box fan in the kitchen. Then, finally, Vince invited him out. To meet the guys, Vince said, if they like you, you might get a job out of it. They'd gone to a Cajun restaurant with the neon sign blaring closed. The side entrance led them to a small dark room where four different men crowded around a crimson table. Bottles of wine on the table, along with a basket of crawfish and cornbread. They were all older, Vincent's age, in their 40s maybe, with thick cheeks and tailored suits. Alex, in his torn jeans and t-shirt, wished he'd gotten the memo. When Vince and Alex entered, the men got quiet and all their eyes turned to Alex. That was when Vince put his hand on Alex's shoulder and said, this is my nephew, Alex, not my niece, not my sister's dyke daughter, not Catherine. This is my nephew, Alex. The other guys bobbed their heads, greeted him to the crew. Meanwhile, Alex quietly broke apart every double helix in his body and bonded it to Vince. At that moment, he knew he'd do anything for his uncle, anything. So far, anything included attending frequent cigar smoke-filled meetings, jacking a car, driving an Impala to Joe's lot to get crushed. Pretty sure there was a body in the trunk. Like, really sure. But that didn't matter, because Alex's loyalties was, loyalty was limitless, because his uncle saw him, the crew saw him. When everyone else turned away from him, they saw him, and they didn't give a shit. So he'd do whatever his uncle needed, even if that meant watching the capo's cat. His uncle's hot breath hit him with every pant, wet and sticky. Yeah, Alex said, capiche. I'll pause there if you want to read the rest of it. 
to all the saints and sinners. Thank you guys for having me so much this year. Uh, meant a lot, and I can't wait to see you all next year. All right, everyone be safe. Have a good one. Hello, my name is Maya Jeffra. I'm one of the finalists for the Saints and Sinners uh, Fiction Anthology 2020. I will be reading just um, a couple excerpts from towards the beginning of my fiction work entitled Jingle Jingle Pop. Champagne would have understood, I don't need no one telling me she didn't take nothing personal, and she wouldn't want me getting all crybaby and shit in front of the girls. Someone had to be mama bad for those pansy-ass chochas. And Champagne knew, knew that I was getting close, and to lose a day, lose an hour, would have been a setback. A setback. I was getting so close. Not just the money, but the whole thing, you know? What the head does. It's like what Donald Trump say in that show, you got to keep the eye on the prize. Champagne knew that, though she was a dumb bitch. That's what got her dead. She stopped looking the Johnny boys up and down, getting the real deal off them, and wound up popping her ass in any car that rolled by. Ooh, the money, it did that thing, you know. She was probably dying in that motherfucker's hands, knowing she bleeding all over. But her eyes went way outside the car window into that place where the promise was, probably smiling away at how soft the life beyond was going to be. It's good I didn't go, for reals. By the time the girls got back from the funeral, I turned a whole day's worth of tricks. Sunday wasn't usually a good day. The Johns at church with their familias. But with all the girls gone, I got the whole spread, easy bread. Champagne would probably say it better use of my time anyway. I can almost hear her. Give me a high five. A tea gotta do what she gotta do. I see them at Benito's the tiny taco shack in the warehouse parking lot at the corner of Las Palmas. The warehouse used to be a porno slinger, but now it's some fancy artist studios. Benito's once be jamming, all those fat porno guys slopping it up, flirting with us, working their job and loving it. But those artists with their skinny ass jeans and beards walk sideways around the damn place. Oh, they eat organic or some shit. Hey though, the shack got shit for food. And that's embarrassing for any Mexican joint in LA. But it was open all night and became the spot. The taquitos are greasy enough to slice through the cum in our mouths. Champagne and me used to come by between tricks and she would play this game. She shimmy up on the stool and lay her head on the counter like she'd be busted. It was so funny. And say, where you, where you be right now if not here? And we'd take our turns saying the Bahamas or Paris or one of them hotels on the Sunset Strip, or some shit. The girls were done up in black, all respectful and funeral-like, but there was no hiding who they were. Pencil skirts stuffed in the hips, stilettos, low-slung blouses to the titty nipple, fake eyelashes with crystals on the tips. Fantasia had a bird in her hair, almost as black as her skin, with white eyes staring out. A whole damn bird. Now what bitch can do that? They were muy glamoroso, popped up on the cracked red plastic stools, crossing their legs like a help in any. Three of them in a row, looking like Elvira just blew up all over Hollywood. So the fuck what? Straight bitches are jealous we do it full out every day. They wish. Sheila, Fantasia, and Mimi, and no champagne. Something about them sitting on those stools without her made it feel real. I pretended to fix an eyelash because I'm not crying in front of nobody, honey. I looked out past the girls at the block, the parking lots, the boxy warehouses, the concrete, the trash in the gutters, the trash cans, the concrete. The LA sun just kind of sat there, no breeze, just dry, still dead heat. All the stanky sweat from plastic back seats and fat ass Johnny boys. It was gonna be real tough on the boulevard without champagne. She was my girl, my family out here, no matter how dumb she be. Thanks you all. Hopefully I'll see you next year at Saints and Sinners when we can all reconvene 
Until then, please be well, be safe. I love you. Hi, I'm Gar McBerry Russell in Oakland, California. I'll be reading an excerpt from my story, Tom of Oaks Hall. My main character, Philip, recalls his life as the only black student at Oak Hall of Law, UC Berkeley School of Jurisprudence in the mid 1930s. In this scene, Philip sees the object of his desire, Tom, in the basement men's room. Though coeducational in the 30s, the basement of Bolt Hall was a men's only space. One evening at the end of spring term, I went to the basement with the intention of retrieving books from my locker for a planned all nighter at home. But first I really had to go pee. I flew through the locker room, into the restroom, and straight to a urinal just to the left of the doorless entryway. The release felt so good. I had sat in the library and held it for too long. Truth be told, the release I experienced actually came from holding my cock in that space at that time of year. At the end of the term with finals moving, overstressed guys emitted pheromones that called to each other for sexual release. I knew this because I once experienced it in the third floor men's room in Doe Library as an undergrad. At that time, it scared me and I avoided the restrooms at night during midterms and finals from then on. I never allowed myself to sate that energy which flowed through me as naturally as Strawberry Creek flows through campus. That evening, I brooked no denial. I turned my head to the right and stared at the shower. I heard its water running. I saw two pairs of feet under the curtain, slightly staggered by their stances and facing each other. The man whose feet were turned away from me lowered himself to a squatting position. His ass crack appeared just below the curtain. He's giving head, I marveled as I kept staring. A face appeared between the folds of the curtain. Tom, I muttered. Steamy mist curled around his flattened red hair, our eyes fixed on each other until Tom slowly withdrew back into the mist and curtain. I heard someone walk into the locker room. I clumsily shoved my hardened cock into my pants, flushed the urinal, and loudly coughed. The squatter, giving Tom head, ran out of the shower and into the adjacent toilet stall. Tom remained unseen in the mist. I went to a sink opposite the toilet stalls and rinsed my hands. Afterward, I leaned my head through the entryway into the locker room. Whoever it had been did not linger long. I turned to face the shower again in time to see Tom step out with a towel wrapped around his waist. He walked up to me, placed his hand on my back, brought his lips very close to the side of my face. I held my breath thinking this can't be happening. Thank you, Tom whispered. Then he walked into the locker room, opened his locker and dropped his towel. For a few glorious moments, his ass appeared, round and firm with whips of red hair on each cheek. It flexed as he shifted his weight while, shipped, while slipping on his underpants. Tom finished dressing quickly, then turned to me again. Are you heading home, he asked, an obvious invitation to walk out of the building together. I have to get something in the library before it closes, I said, a complete lie. Tom smiled and bid me a good night, then departed. The squad emerged from the toilet stall, still wet, but fully dressed. He also departed, but not without giving me a warm smile, a silent thanks for running interference. I drifted into the last toilet stall, the one farthest from the little shower, a tear trailed on my cheek. That tall red-headed dandy brought fiery passion into my otherwise road existence. Don't just study life away, Tom chided. Come on! The year had been a feast. Ibsen and Wheeler Auditorium for lunch, Frankenstein at the movies for supper, Britain at midnight on Dorothy's record player for a nightcap and my mind undressed Tom each time we got together, my eyes following every contour of his clothing, the bulging muscles, the lump at his crotch, the crease at his ass crack. Never before had I fallen so hard for someone, and now this, naked from head to toe, a more magnificent body I could not have imagined. It was more than I could stand. 
But I pumped good and hard sitting on that stall. At climax, I wanted to let out a blood curling scream, but kept the sound within while my mouth gaped wide open. My ears rang, my mind and body drained. As the ringing abated, my panting eased and my heart slowed. Cum dripped from my hands to my legs and into the toilet bowl. Feebly, I took some tissue, wiped my hands. For a long while, I sat undisturbed, unnoticed, alone. Then I closed my eyes, cupped my hands over my face, and sobbed as I had never sobbed before. Thank you. I'm honored and excited to be included in this year's Fixed Anthology. My thanks to Saints and Sinners, and I look forward to seeing everyone next year in New Orleans. Take care and be safe. So, hello. So, I'm EJ Robinson, and I'm coming to you from London. Um, I'm going to be reading uh, an excerpt from my short story, which was a runner up um, in the 2020 competition. Um, it's called Because of the Times, and I'm going to start from the beginning. Uh, so uh, this is Because of the Times. Everything was prepared. May had scrubbed the ground floor of the house from corner to corner. Flowers filled the living room to eliminate at last the lingering odours of illness. The rugs were hoovered, the cushions plumped, every surface shone. In the kitchen, the kettle was whistling to a boil on the hob beside plates of freshly cut sandwiches and triangles of folded paper napkins. Graham would have told her she deserved to sit down after such hard work. Not just yet, she would have said in return, as she fished a clean rag out from under the sink. The pictures still needed dusting. The photographs of May's life with Graham began in the front hall and advanced chronologically through the ground floor. Above the living room hearth hung their wedding portrait, two strawberry blondes standing amidst a flurry of rice thrown in a vanished world. They had been so young. On the nights when her complaining bones made sleep itself a dream, May would lie awake and think of those two blonde rice rained youngsters. If they had known back then how the world was going to change, would they have chosen differently? A slam from upstairs made the lilies on the windowsill shiver. May lowered her rag and raised her eyes to the ceiling. Terrible, really. That her own son put her instincts on alert as though an intruder was in the house. May wouldn't change anything about her marriage to Graham, except having Henry. She'd had many wishes for her son's life in his infancy. He'd taken many years to arrive and had been so wanted. But when he finally came, Henry proved himself time and time again to be anything but a blessing. As the years passed, May's hopes for him winked out one by one, spent as ancient stars. The only wish she had left now was to give her husband the send-off he deserved. The mourners were due soon. May shuffled back into the kitchen and picked up a fresh rag. One of the countless, and they really were countless, photos of his parents slithered to the floor when Henry kicked their wardrobe door shut. He tucked a tattered shoebox under one arm and crunched over the fallen frame on his way out, cracking the glass over his parents' faces. The night he'd returned home, Henry had worked his way through the contents of his father's liquor cabinet, then spent the granite-tinted hours of dawn puking over porcelain, shock, not booze, the cause of his twisting stomach. It was impossible he'd been cut from his parents' will. He was the only child. The only possible explanation could be that when his father had been off his head on meds, his mother had made the old boy sign a new version of the will that excluded Henry. Knowing her mania for hanging onto every scrap of paperwork she ever handled in her life, her original version had to be somewhere in the house. All he needed to do was find it. But after hours of hunting, Henry, weaving on his knees amongst decades of bank statements and mortgage repayment papers, had to admit there was no other will. Upon his mother's death, the house, the money, the shares, all of it, would go straight into the pocket of May's only sibling, Esther, that freak, their last and most public display of disappointment in him. Now, on the afternoon of his father's funeral, he could hear his mother shuffling around downstairs, moving dust from corner to corner, 
and boiling the kettle for the hundredth time in preparation for the guests. Everyone in town was coming because everyone in town had loved his father, which was why the afternoon was going to be so satisfying. Henry had only one wish left, to give his father the send-off the treacherous miser deserved. The mourners were due soon. Henry tucked the shoebox, the afternoon's entertainment, under one arm and felt in his pocket for a well-deserved cigarette. And we'll stop there. Uh, so just to take a moment to say thank you very much uh, to the festival, to Saints and Sinners, uh, for shortlisting my story. Um, and thank you very much in general. We shall hopefully see you at the festival next year. Um, and just generally, yes, thank you very much. I hope everybody stays safe uh, and well. Hi, I'm Gania Barlow. I'm going to be reading from my story, Lily, Rosemary, and the Jack of Hearts, which is based on the Bob Dylan song of the same name. And I'll be starting at the beginning of the story. Intro, Jack of Hearts, an unselfish relative, a sincere friend. The Jack of Hearts, they say, is a man of many talents. They say he can pick a lock like it's a knotted rope, charm women like they're snakes, rides like a centaur, drinks like a whale, the sharpest shooter, the coolest bluffer, the quickest, the quietest, the boldest. His deeds murmur through prairie grasses and gallop down horseshoed trails. His name keens around the campfire like the loveliest heartbreak and drifts as smoke up into the hills. But the Jack of Hearts is not what she seems to be. She is a red card dressed in black. She knows the way of the gun, the warm, thick taste of smoke on her teeth, horse sweat and leather, trail dust in her hair and her mustache smell of dynamite on her fingers. She watches you from under her hat, through her mask, behind trick mirrors. She'll learn all of your secrets and never give up hers. She has the key to your dearest treasure pressed in wax. The Jack of Hearts is always in disguise. Verse one, nine of diamonds, a roving disposition combined with honorable and successful adventure. It is perpetually fall, that sad, bleak, dirty quality clings to everything, twines around the church steeple, hitches itself to hitching posts, hangs from the scaffold. It is the autumn of this life. The West is no longer exactly wild. The buildings are all still mainly wood and nails, but the railroad will be here soon, and things will change. You can feel it in the air, like dust suspended in a beam of sunlight. See it rumbling up over the horizon, dark in the east, Tonight, it is warm and clear. The lights are coming on in the cabaret, and men are fluttering toward it like moths. Jack pauses in the doorway of the whiskey-smoked bar room. She cuts a figure, dark against the orange and pink sky. No one looks. There is a tension in the moment, like water bulging at the lip of a glass, but it goes unnoticed by the rough men within. They've drained so many glasses down that one more tipping cup is of little interest. But Jack feels it. This is, after all, her line of work, and she knows what's at stake. She knows exactly what is swirling at the edge of the cup. The stranger at the door of the bar, the women dressing, the rich man fingering his knife, the outlaws lying in wait. The water breaks itself and spills over, and Jack moves into the honey lamplight of the low-slung room. Verse 2, Eight of Hearts. Pleasure mixing in society. The Jack of Hearts sidles up to the bar, lays some money down, and projects her voice, husky and sly. Set it up for everyone, she says. This stranger is noticed, sized up. They see her as a young man, cocky, struck it temporarily rich, wiry, smallish. She's slapped on the back, she's toasted, she's forgotten. This is just what she wants. Because she knows to listen for it, she hears the muffled sound of a drill, the thud and creak of movement in the tailor shop next door, which shares its other wall with the bank. She is the only one who hears it. She asks the bartender with a wink what time the show begins and dissolves into a corner. Verse three, queen of diamonds, a fair woman, fond of gaiety and a coquette. Backstage, the girls are deep in their usual pre-show poker game. Lily has two queens, diamonds and hearts, and is pretty sure she can expect a third. She watches the backs of the other girls' hands and listens for the quiet signs, for the breath, the heartbeat, the murmur of the cards. Lily rarely loses. Queen of spades. She stuffs the bills into her brassiere, 
It'll all go back to the other girls in loans and presents anyway. She doesn't need to not bother about money. The new coat of paint in her room, Robin's Egg Blue, brought all the way from Boston, will attest to that. She's got Big Jim, somewhat literally, wrapped around her finger. He'd like to think it's some kind of agreement, some kind of contract, that, if not love, there is some similarity of temperament, some style or idea that binds them together. But Lily knows that rings can just as easily be taken off as put on. She prefers the cabaret life, the smoke and perfume, the late-night poker games, the girls slipping into her room to cry on her shoulder, kissing away their tears, the lace and paint to cover rough wood and smooth skin, silk, cigarettes, and brandy, and singing. Lily deals. The game catches the pace of the footsteps in the street outside, catches the rising tremor of the barroom, catches, somehow, inexplicably, the lonely, gentle moan of the twilight breeze through the open window. Lily draws the jack of hearts. Okay, I'll stop there. I'm so excited and grateful to be a part of the Saints and Sinners anthology. And I want to thank everybody involved in the festival and, of course, everybody out there for listening to this and reading the story. Thank you. Hi, my name is Scott Pomfret, and I am recording this in Provincetown, Massachusetts. I am going to be reading from my story while trying to escape right from the very beginning. The moment my dark boat friend and I stepped up, up onto the le levee, a freedom agent greeted us at gunpoint, pistol cocked, eyes narrowed, hand firm, brass buttons shining. He demanded my boat friend's papers. Me, I'm a small man. I shrieked and cowered and acted nothing like a manly and proper sailor. My boat friend, he extracted papers from his sea bag with the dignity of a newly elected pope. Made uneasy by my boat friend's confidence, the freedom agent's mustaches twitched, his eyes bulged, his face dripped sweat like a turnip unearthed from the soil at high noon. Refusing to examine the unexpected papers, he demanded instead an accounting of my boat friend's history and his business in New Orleans. I've no business yet, my boat friend cheerfully replied, the history of that, sir, I've plenty. No man in all the world had such a tendency towards hyperbolic amplification as my boyfriend. And calling himself Ulysses, he described a blasphemous and unbecoming life consisting equally of bits of African kings, ancient libraries without end, blinding riches, catamite service, flesh rites, epic battles, mythic beasts, and marvelous escapes. <laughs> Flummoxed, the freedom agent dropped my boat friend's papers in the mud as if they were infected by yellow fever. He jerked a thumb to the registry shack at the levee's end where my boat friend was to de declare himself like a load of cargo at the counting house. No free Negro can stay in Louisiana longer than 30 days, the freedom agent warned. I'll come find you myself and see if in your, you're in the mood for stories then. Stories of the freedom agent's rough welcomes had made their way back across the ocean to my own Cork City, Ireland. Originally known as fever agents and formed during the epidemic of 1848, their original task was to prevent new immigrant ships from landing and corralling Irishmen already arrived into the neighborhood of the Irish Channel where a mix of Irish and slaves were compelled at rifle point to build a wall around themselves in a futile effort to check the fever's spread. For two years, the agents kept the quarantine, and when the fever finally ebbed, the agents nevertheless persisted and were their own form of pestilence. They found new work at the ports and new champions in the city hall. Persecutors of every difference, they turned from preventing fever to ferreting out anarchic continental tendencies, membership in Hibernian societies, sexual perversion, negrophilia, and abolitionism. In the 1850s, the Know Nothing Party, who were great supporters of the agent's work, secured power, and every patronage post was filled with one of theirs. One happy beneficiary of the Know Nothing's political largesse was the hostile clerk we met in the registry shack at Levy's End, which the freedom agent had directed us. He demanded every last bit of data for my boyfriend, but the length of his shillelagh, and though I readily suspected the latter datum was of greatest interest to him. All the while, he scribbled in his ledger. The clerk stole sly and appraising glances at Ulysses, and no wonder, my boat friend was a prepossessing specimen, twice my weight and height, skin the color of copper, a high forehead that gave him an unearned name for honesty, cheekbones like a king, the words, I regret this already, tattooed on his right shoulder blade. And strong, it was nothing for Ulysses to carry a barrel of flour under each arm and another on his head. For every man he had killed or maimed, Ulysses had added a bead to his necklace, which was by that time nearly 30 feet long 
and longer still it might have been, but he, only count, he counted only the white men for victims and not the colors of any race. Setting aside his ledger and brandishing a ma magnifying glass, the clerk demanded Ulysses strip to his skivvies so that he might... so that he might inspect him for signs of fever. Ulysses gave him something to inspect that was much more satisfying to both parties, and Ulysses and the clerk detained us no further. Free to proceed, we encountered pure chaos. Choked with the off scrapings of scuppers and casks, the Mississippi River burned fierce as a dose of the clap. And I'm gonna stop there. Thank you for listening. Hi. My name is K.W. Holland, and my story titled A Sneeze appears in the 2020 anthology produced by the Saints and Sinners Literary Festival, and I'd like to read the first couple of pages to you now. During his third month at home, someone broke into the house while Carter napped. They didn't break in, his husband Jason corrected later that evening. They just opened the door and walked in. It was more like a walk-in. They might have even sauntered. Carter was eating a banana because it had been safely ensconced in its peel during the invasion and thus hadn't been touched. You keep saying that, he said, through a mouthful of mush. Do you think there was more than one? I think there was only one. Well, it could have been a he or a she or an it for all we know. We don't know how they identified. Jason bent down and reached into the recesses of the refrigerator for a yogurt. He was still dressed for the office. Usually he came home, dashed into the bedroom, and re-emerged wearing sweats. Tonight, though, the police had been there when he arrived. You still think I'm making it up. I never said you were making it up. Not once did I say that. There was someone here in the house. And there had been. Carter was sure of it. Yes, he'd been groggy and heavy-eyed when he stumbled out of the bedroom to investigate whatever sound had stirred him awake. But the key word here, he thought, was awake. He was awake. He'd been awake when he saw the front door swinging half open. He was awake when, through the picture window next to that door, he saw what could have only been a human figure race through the yard, a blur beneath the aging willow trees that shadowed their lawn. The blur reached the sidewalk and vanished before Carter's mind was clear enough to recognize what was happening. But he'd been awake. Hadn't he been? Well, we're lucky they didn't take anything, Jason said. Then he scooped yogurt into his mouth with a spoon like a hungry robot, one quick sweep after another. Yes, we are lucky. I scared them away before they could take anything. The police said so. Well, one of them, the nice heavy set ginger, had said so. The other, a woman whose blonde hair seemed as brittle as her dark eyes seemed hard, kept smacking her lips and asking about the noise that had woken him up. Nothing broken. Nothing knocked to the floor? Did the intruder say something, perhaps? Call out a warning or a greeting? Him, Carter said now after he swallowed the last of his banana. I scared him away before he could take anything. There was definitely only one of them, and he was definitely a man, I think. Really? Jason placed the empty yogurt container next to the banana peel on the granite top peninsula which was otherwise, like the rest of the kitchen, completely clear and scrubbed to the point of glossiness. Since the cancer had taken away Carter's ability to continue working, he felt it was now his job to prowl around the house with a bottle of surface cleaner, like Mommy Dearest on a bender. He thought of the cancer as an entity with a mind of its own, fighting for its own life against his, and Winnie. Jason continued, You're definite about this? Did you remember something else? Something we should tell the police? Should we call them back? No, no, it's just a feeling I have. All right, all right. Jason put an arm on Carter's shoulder and smiled at him in a way Carter thought was meant to reassure. Sorry you've had such a day, hon. At least now we know to keep the doors locked. Even when we're home, it seems. I'll stop there. And thanks to Paul and Tracy and everyone at the Saints and Sinners Literary Festival for including my story, as a finalist this year. It's a big honor, and I hope to see everyone next year in 2021 when we're able to hopefully return to New Orleans. Thanks.